Okay, so in today's lab, I want to go over WebSockets. This will be a relatively short lab, um, and we'll build a real-time chat app or like chat uh, form. We'll use a module called Socket.io, which is uh, available through Node and Express, and uh, it uses a concept called WebSockets. And so WebSockets are a, it's a, another mechanism by which a server and client can communicate uh, that is a little different than HTTP. So we'll go over that in just a minute when we cover the learning objectives. So let's break down effectively the table of contents of what we're going to be covering today. There's only going to be six goals. This is going to be a, uh, a light introduction into Socket.io, but in a way that should provide you with all the meaningful mechanisms so that you can incorporate this into your own applications. We'll start off with a lab introduction and talk about what are web sockets, what are socket, what is Socket.io, uh, what is event emitting, and what is broadcasting. All these concepts are pretty critical for building a application that relies on sockets. Then we'll talk a little bit about the design of our WebSocket uh, uh, application, some design patterns, approaches for modeling a distributed application. And then we'll actually start building at, out our application. We'll start with using NPM to build out our configuration file, which will be our package.json, where we'll initialize our configuration file for our app. Then the second goal will be to just go ahead and define a Express app. You, building out a static HTTP server, we're going to do this a slightly different than we've done in previous labs. And that's because we want to use our server alongside a WebSocket server as well. So we'll see how we set that up slightly differently. And so um, the next thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and actually set up our WebSocket server and uh, a socket IO connection so that we can listen between the server and the browser. After that, I'll go ahead and uh, handle disconnect events. So we'll be able to send events over the, the, the wire uh, on a disconnect event. We'll, we're gonna go and do something, probably a console log, just to go ahead and response to that. Then we'll learn about emitting our own events to the server from our client. Uh, the event we'll be sending in this app is gonna be a chat message from our browser to the server, but you could expand this concept to be any kind of events for whatever your application is. And then we'll learn how to then take that, uh, an event on the server and then rebroadcast it out to all the other clients. And then that will pretty much be it. That'll be a basic chat application that allows clients to communicate in real time with other clients using the server as kind of the broadcasting uh, node. And then we'll just go over some basic concluding notes. So here, in terms of our lab introduction, there's no real prereqs for this. You have to have Node and NPM installed, but you should have those installed from the prior labs. Uh, our motivation here is to learn how to use WebSockets and the Socket.io module. Our goal is to design and implement a real-time chat app that runs in the browser. And the learning objectives for today's lab is we want to go ahead and learn how to use WebSockets. What are WebSockets? And WebSockets are a, um, it's a uh, protocol. So what implements that protocol so that we can actually use it inside the node environment is going to be Socket.io. So Socket.io is just an implementation of WebSockets. And so that's a module that'll make using WebSockets very easy for us. And it handles a lot of the, uh, the lower level communications um, uh, for us. So we don't have to be concerned about those details. We'll learn how to connect with web sockets. We'll learn how to emit socket events from the web client and the, the server. And then we'll also learn how to listen for socket events and how to bind a callback function such to handle them. So pretty much the metaphor for how we listen for events and then bind callbacks to it, it's going to be very similar to what we've already seen. It's a, it's a common design pattern in JavaScript as a whole. The server-side architecture for our um, application is going to be listed here, and we're going to actually go ahead and scaffold this out. So let's start our project by making a project folder. 
where all of our assets and scripts will be organized, and then we'll create all these necessary files and folders as illustrated below. Now, this uh, application does not require any additional resources, so there's no need to get any starter files. We'll build everything from scratch over the course of this lab. So let's actually start doing this. So I'm going to make a directory, chat app. Okay, perfect. I'll go into that. Now I'm going to go ahead and make a package.json and let's go into here. Yep. Okay, perfect. And let's also go ahead and make a app.js. So the package.json will have all my configuration information. My app.js is going to have all my server setup stuff. All of my, it'll, it'll be my server logic. I'm going to create a public directory, which is supposed to be all of the static documents, such as my HTML files, my JavaScript files, my um, CSS scripts that are to be hosted by the HTTP, HTTP server to the client. So let me go ahead and make that. So let's make a new directory. We will call it public because it's designed for public access. And then inside of that, inside of this public uh, directory, I'm going to create the index.html file that we will serve to the client. Okay. And let me, yep, it's in there. And then the index.html file will itself rely on some client side JavaScript code. So I'm going to create a scripts directory to hold all of the client side scripts inside of the public directory. So inside of public, I will create a new directory called scripts. Very similar to what we've done previously when building client side applications. And then uh, let's actually create the JavaScript file that will put our logic in for our client side portion of the application. So let's go and create a file inside of public inside of scripts, we will call it chat.js. Excellent. And let me just go and there it is. So now my directory structure looks exactly what we have here. And we'll start to implement that throughout the course of this lab. So let's talk about some of the learning concepts. Uh, the WebSocket protocol is a alternative protocol to the HTTP protocol. Uh, it uses um, it's used to establish a client side communications, just like HTTP is, but it varies from HTTP in many ways. Uh, before there was WebSockets, web clients would have to repeatedly pull servers for new data, and this was an inadequate way for transmitting real time data. So recall in HTTP, it uses that request response approach that we've been making a lot of use out of in our prior labs. Um, one key thing about HTTP is that it's a stateless connection, right? Uh, it's not a continuous connection, right? It's the web client that must initialize the connection each time, which means it's not a full du duplex connect, uh, connection. It means it's not like a pipe where the client can send data and then the server and the client and the server. It's more like sending letters where the client sends a uh, request and then it's followed up with a response. And then every time the client needs to do something else, it has to send a new request. WebSockets is different from that. It uses a bi-directional. So it's a two-way and it uses a full duplex, which means that both the client and the server can send and receive information. Now, it's also a stateful connection, which means it's maintained. It's not just... Um, it's not just followed up with the response and then uh, disconnected. So once a connection is established, either the client or the server may send that uh, data. And servers may broadcast data to all connected clients. So there's a lot of distinctions. There's a lot of possibilities that WebSockets open up to you that just are not possible or very grueling to do with the HTTP protocol. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, what it means to poll a server, because polling servers using HTTP is still a common approach for things that are not real time. So it might still be a solution you want to make use of so in case you don't need the overhead of WebSocket. So we'll talk about when that might be appropriate. Now let's talk a little bit about Socket.io. Socket.io 
it's a library that enables real-time bi-directional and event-based communication between the browser and the server. It's a implementation of WebSockets. So WebSockets is it's a, a, a protocol in and of itself. Socket.io is an implementation in JavaScript for WebSockets. And so it does, since it's this library, it's designed to handle a lot of these uh, calls for us very easily. Again, if you wanted to learn more about Socket.io, you can go to Socket.io's webpage, and there's a lot of great documentation for both the server level API and the client API. Okay, so one thing to know is that since we're talking about a protocol that allows bi-directional communication between the server and the client, that means that there has to be something that exists on the server side, and there's something that has to be uh, set up on the client side for this connection to be established. So for the server, and we use socket IO for both those sides, uh, that's one advantage of having both sides of our web stack built in JavaScript. So on the server side, uh, we'll use Node and, and Express Server to set up a WebSocket server that listens for events and handles them. And then on the client side, what we're going to do is we're going to establish a connection with the WebSocket server and then emit and handle socket events via JavaScript that will pass through a socket object that's connected to our socket server on our web server. And the way that the communications happen between the server and the client is through events. So the same way we've been managing callbacks through kind of our viewport, we're gonna do the same thing by setting up events on the client and then listening for those events on the server and then binding callback functions when those events happen or binding data alongside those events. So events are, man are exchanged between the server and client through a socket object. And a socket event has a name and a data payload, both the server and the client can listen for events and may trigger a function, a callback function in response. The payload data is provided to the callback function. So we're gonna see this in action when we try to exchange messages. Now, again, I wanna highlight that JSON, short for JavaScript object notation, is a format of encapsulating and serializing data for transmitting between one application to another. JSON has outgrown even JavaScript to become a, uh, just a way of serializing uh, data because it's, it's extraordinarily human readable. So one way that we can transmit data from one end to the other is the same way that we were able to do with HTTP, we'll also do that with WebSockets. And in Mongo, when you go to use Mongo as a database uh, in the upcoming uh, uh, labs, and if you watch the lectures, you'll see that Mongo is a database store that actually stores JSONs. So um, a WebSockets transmit data as JSON, which can then be treated as our JavaScript objects in our client side or our server side JavaScript runtime environments. And so just a quick note about what the difference between HTTP polling versus WebSockets are. Well, HTTP polling uses the HTTP protocol. And so recall, in the HTTP protocol, it relies on the client to send a request to the server and the server then sends a response. So imagine if your web application has data that can update in real time and you wanna make sure the client side is up to date, uh, as up to date as possible. Well, without WebSockets, you can do what's called polling. And what polling is, it's the process of a web client repeatedly making requests to the web server to ensure that the data is up to date. And it, it, again, it's used in real-time applications. This pattern uh, evolved due to the limitation of HTTP, which is relying on the client to establish the connection. WebSockets maintain their connection between the server and client, so that allows service to initialize data transfer to all connected clients, and the WebSockets are much better suited for real-time applications like chat rooms or multiplayer games or live news tickers or updates or anything else. I certainly want to broadcast data updates to the client side and not have to wait for the data, the, the client to say wait every minute and then pull the server to say, is there something new? Is there something new? Is there something new? Does that just, that overhead just doesn't work for something like a multiplayer game, for instance, where you need to have up-to-date information as readily as possible. 
Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about WebSockets and how they distinguish themselves from um, HTTP protocol, let's talk about some design patterns that would be best to kind of be a little familiar with. So the following considerations will help you design a distributed app whereby real-time data may be initialized and shared across a software system, system running uh, on multiple machines. So first of all is this idea of event-driven communication. Here, the idea is we want to decompose the actions of your application into events. So if with Socket.io, uh, it may emit these events from a client or the server to all the other connected machines. Consider designing an app that coordinates all data states updates with such named events. Now, the, the second thing to try to consider is serializing your app data. So to ensure that your app's data is easily, easily modeled so it can be serialized and deserialized, so it can be sent from a server to a client or from a client to uh, the server, you have to plan for that effectively. So to effectively do that, in order to transmit the state to all your clients and servers, you should consider what has to be shared and how can you encapsulate that in a JSON. That's what we'll be using. That's what's commonly used. You could also use binary data that is supported, but JSON is a very effective means. So plan for that with your data models on how you're going to coordinate your updates. The third thing to consider is what is the role for your server? The common role of a server in a WebSocket app is to maintain the true state of the web app that all other clients will then rely on. The server broadcasts the state changes to all connected users. And so the concern of the server is in maintaining the data and sharing it. Whereas the client roles would uh, differ just slightly. So the common role of a client in a WebSocket application is to support the user controls and trigger actions that change the state of the app. These changes are then emitted from the client to the server because the server is the thing that's maintaining the true state of the app so that all connected clients can access it. So these changes are emitted from the client to the server to sync those changes to all other connected users. Note that the app state does not actually update until the server state does. So you shouldn't see reflected changes on just your client side. You should send an event when you make a mutation to the state of the app to the server and then let the server broadcast it out to all clients simultaneously. That way everything's always in sync. Okay, so those are just some considerations if you were to design a uh, real-time application. And uh, so with that said, let's actually start building out our application today. So as our first goal, we're going to start very simple. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, set up our configuration file, our package.json. And uh, we'll go ahead and initialize that with NPM. So the approach here is the approach we've been using. We we'll use NPM and package.json to install all of our app dependencies and to define and launch a command to start up our application. So the first thing we need to do is we need to open up package.json and implement all of the metadata that manages, builds, and launches our node application. So let's go over here. We have our chat app. Let's go to package.json. Let's bring this into our IDE. And let's take a look at how we're going to configure this. So this looks like all um, the configuration files we've commonly been making. Here we'll have the name of our app. We'll call it just socket chat, chat app here. We also have a version of our app. We'll just uh, set our version to 0.0.1. It's the initial build. We have a small description of our app, a real-time chat app with socket IO. Here we will define the scripts that we can go ahead and invoke from NPM. We want a start script. The start script will just invoke app.js. Uh, and then for dependencies, we will initially cite as one of our dependencies express. Since we will build this, we'll use express to expressly build out our web architecture. Okay, so once I do that, I'll do NPM install. And oh, what do we have here? Where am I? Let me make sure I'm in. Alas. Okay, let's actually. Hmm. 
let's uh, remove that and actually make sure that we're inside the appropriate. There we go. Okay, so now that we're actually inside of the directory that has our package.json, we can go ahead and tell it to install because npm re relies on that package.json file to do all the build instructions for our app. So now with npm install, we successfully go ahead and build out our dependencies. So now we see we have this node modules and we have this package-lock.json file that it produces for us. Excellent. Let me clear that now. Okay, and the next thing I wanna do here is what I just did. We're gonna use npm uh, to uh, install and npm uses that package.json file to fetch and download the app's dependencies. And so after that, we should have that node modules folder, which we did. So the next thing we're going to do is now actually start to build out the logic of our express app as a static HTTP server. So despite the fact that we wanna use WebSockets for our app, we have to initially set this process up using HTTP. So we need an HTTP server to deliver the index.html file, to deliver our client side uh, scripts and, and to initially then uh, build our WebSocket server on top of. So let's start by just building a simple static HTTP server, and then we're gonna extend that out further inside of our application. And again, Express makes this easy to just listen on a port and serve static files. So again, the big approach here is um, we'll use the built-in modules from Express that make building our backend web services much, much easier. So we'll import those modules and use them in the app to listen for requests, and this will make it easy to set up a web server that we can then extend the functionality of. So here in our first step, let's import the express module, instantiate it into a variable and set up a port number. So here, let's go here to our app.js file. And let's see what we're gonna do here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import the express module that we now have access to because we have it installed as one of our dependencies and so i will bind that to the express uh, variable here and then that's going to be a function i'm going to invoke that function which is going to set up an express application for me so then i'll go ahead and save that into a variable now since i need access to the server to also set up my websocket server this is where we're going to go a little bit differently than what we've done in the past. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to import the HTTP module. And so that HTTP module, as you might recall uh, from those lectures and from the prior lab, when we examine just Node on its own by building out its own static server, it has a collection of methods. One of them is to create a server. So here we want to create an HTTP server for our app. So we're going to pass in our express app into that. So it'll make a server for this app for us. And we'll go ahead and bind that onto this variable. Then I'll use express. We want to use some middleware. So we want our express app to uh, use as a set up as a static server using the public directory so all of the files in the public directory will then be served as static files from our http server now once we have our middleware set up and we've set up our uh, our static um, location for being able to deliver files we'll go ahead and then tell our http server to listen on port 3000 and then we're just going to give it a callback function such that once it starts listening and it effectively launches it'll just invoke this console log to say it's listening on local host 3000. Excellent. So now that we have set up a static server uh, that's on our Express app that's going to deliver from the public directory, why don't we actually go ahead and implement 
our HTML file, our index.html file, uh, so that it'll actually, when it delivers that, there's some content on there in terms of our chat room app. So let's go in here inside of the public directory. I have this index.html. Let me open that up into my IDE here. And what I'm going to do is we're going to do some HTML. So standard HTML, we'll have a head tag, we'll have a body tag. Inside the head tag, we'll just have a title like socket.io.chat. Inside the body, I'll have this unordered list and I'll give it an ID so that I can access it from my script, the chat.js script eventually. I'm not going to worry about that yet. We're just trying to see if we can get this delivered to our browser, but we're going to pre-plan for that now. Then I'm also going to have a form where I'll give an ID. So again, that I so I can access it from my uh, from my JS uh, script on the client side. Uh, I'm going to give my form an action, but again, effectively, we want this form to send data through the WebSocket, not through HTTP. And the default behavior of a form is to uh, to use um, HTTP. So we'll just leave that blank for now because we're not actually going to use an HTTP action type. Uh, then we'll go ahead and inside of our form, we'll define an input field. And we'll make sure that autocomplete is off so it doesn't give any kind of suggestions as you start to type into it. And then we'll also have a button that will be our submit button for this form. Okay. And then once I've done that, Let's go ahead and test this, right? That's the rest of this implementation. We should have a static server and a server, a, a file to serve. So let's start our app and see if we can't go to localhost 3000 and get uh, our HTML page rendered. So let's do npm start. Okay, so we've successfully launched. We got that message listing on 3000. Let's go over to here and let's, Go to localhost, port number 3000, hit refresh, and indeed, there we go. We have a title, socket IO chat, we have our input, and we have a send button. Excellent. Right now, it doesn't do anything, right? I can click on that, but there's no action. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is actually create a socket IO connection. Uh, so here our goal will be to initialize a WebSocket between our server and our browser with socket IO. Uh, the general approach on how we'll do this is we're going to set up a socket IO on the server and the browser to establish a WebSocket connection. So a socket IO is composed of two parts. It's the server that integrates with or mounts the Node.js HTTP server socket IO. And then there's going to be a client library that loads on the browser side that'll be socket.io-client. And so what'll happen is when the server goes to host the index.html files, it's actually the WebSocket server will actually host its own socket client library that it'll deliver and that we'll have to put as a import into our index.html uh, file so that that socket object that then gets loaded on the client side is connected to the server socket and we can send information back and forth through that socket object on the client side. So the first thing we need to do is install the socket IO dependency. Now, I haven't showed you this. So far, what we've done prior is I go into my dependencies and I just do, I keep adding them directly. But in today's lab, I want to show you a different way as you're developing that you can go ahead and install dependencies. So say, for instance, I want to add this dependency in my app as I'm developing socket IO. Instead of having to update my package.json each time from the command line, I could just do npm install socket IO, the module I want. And look what's going to happen here. So npm install socket.io. So if I do that, it's going to it's going to install that dependency and it's going to automatically update my package.json for me. So I've been avoiding showing you some of these shortcut tricks like this. So you get really familiar with building out this configuration file manually. 
But here you can see how you can start to very easily build out your package.json with modules from the command line. In fact, if you were to do npm init, I-N-I-T, it'll actually build out your package.json automatically for you. And then you wouldn't have to remember all these keywords and values. But again, as a pedagogical approach, I find value in manually typing these out so you get comfortable with what's inside of this configuration file. But there are certainly shortcuts to produce these that are easier than the way we've been doing them in labs. Okay, so now that we have our dependency installed, we can now use Socket.io inside of our Express application. So let's go ahead and set up our Socket.io on the server. So basically what we want to do is import and initialize a new instance of Socket.io by passing the server, that HTTP server object, which is why we want to have a reference to it, and then listen on for a connection event on, that, on the Socket.io server uh, for any kind of incoming sockets and invoke a callback handler function that just logs to the console whenever a connection is made. So we'll actually, we'll, we'll step through this. So the first thing we want to do is after we, let's go to our app.js. So after we have our HTTP server made, what we need to do is we're going to import our socket IO module, and we're just going to bind that to socket IO, a variable here. And then we're going to call that function that we go ahead and import from the module to set up our socket IO server. And in order to set up the server, we have to pass it an HTTP server that it will use. So we're gonna pass it the server we just created right up here on line four. And that's gonna give us back a WebSocket server that we will then go ahead and save as IO on our server side. So here, this is our HTTP server, and this is our WebSocket server. So then what I wanna do is after I set up my Express app, after I set up my Express app here to serve um, all static files from the public directory, I wanna use the WebSocket server and I wanna start listening for events that come from clients. So to bind event names to callback functions, we use the on function. So you can think of on this event from the IO server, from the WebSocket server, we're gonna invoke this callback function. So there's one of the default events that are, uh, predefined by Socket.io is the connection event. And this happens automatically whenever a client connects to the WebSocket server. And so we're gonna create a callback function that triggers when a connection occurs. So let's go here and actually create. Okay, so here I'm just gonna create a function that's gonna be called on connection. Again, it's the callback function we're binding to the connection event. And so every, every um, callback function that gets registered to the WebSocket server will potentially get a socket object passed into it. So we're going to define as our parameter a socket object, but we're not going to do anything with it in this particular step, but we will use this later on in future steps. Uh, right now, all we're going to do is when this connect gets uh, triggered, when this connect uh, a connection event occurs, we're just going to console log to say, hey, a user connected. To illustrate the server recognizes that a uh, user is connected. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to add some script tags into the body of our HTML. The browser needs to import the JavaScripts to request a WebSocket connection to be established. And the socket IO client module uh, is exposed automatically by the server at the get endpoint of socket.io slash socket.io.js. So this is a JavaScript file 
that gets produced by the WebSocket server and gets automatically exposed to our client side when it goes to import all its other scripts. And so it has all of the details on how to connect to this particular server so that when our server imports the JS file, we can actually set up a socket and send our information to that socket through the WebSocket via this uh, script. And the way that we do that is super simple. We just import this script at slash socket IO slash socket IO dot JS. Now we also want to import our JS, uh, our chat script so that we can do things with that socket. And what we'll do initially with that socket is just, you know, uh, um, in initialize it and, and, and bind it to a variable. So let's go to our index.html. So here at the bottom, I want to import these two scripts. One that's, uh, that's built for us from the WebSocket server that we'll need, and that'll give us the socket object that's connected to the server. And the other will be the chat JS file that we're building out. And actually, let me go over here and actually, I want to use the WebSockets server to initialize a socket object that we can then use to manage the WebSocket in the browser. So there's no need to specify a URL with IOA, IO like we do with Fetch or anything, because it's defaulted to the host that serves the page. So effectively, the same local host 3000 will be where we send all of our requests to. So here, I'll just put that in there, save that. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to launch our web server and see if it uh, actually goes ahead and loads and we'll check to see if we get that console log on the server side as it loads that page to us to illustrate that, hey, that connection event was detected by the WebSocket server. So let's see. So let's clear this. Let's do um, uh, npm start. Okay, so now we're listening. Now let me go on here. I'm gonna do a refresh on this page and notice right here, a user is connected. So that illustrates that we have now established a connection event to our WebSocket server and it got handled by that callback function. And if I refresh the page again, you see a user is connected. So let's take an, another couple of looks over here. Let's go into our developer tools on our browser side. And uh, did I call it socket? Notice here I have that socket. The one reason why I wanted to bind it on the step is so that we could actually inspect it on the client side. So here's the socket that we imported from that script. It shows that we're connected, disconnected, false. It gives us an ID. We have IO, right? This is our manager. They, we can inspect all the different uh, uh, web socket, uh, or, I'm sorry, socket object properties right inside of here. So we can see the state. And so this is what we'll be using to send our data in real time to our web server. And in fact, let me see this here. Let's open up another tab and let's see if we can't see what uh, this JS file that got exposed to us, right? We should be able to access that with a Git file. And this isn't something we wrote, right? This is something provided to the, oh, no. Oh, I might have to do public. Okay, so public, uh, no, that's not right. Okay, there it is. Okay, so you'll see right here, when we say, go to slash socket. Now notice the other one was scripts slash chat.js because we're putting our own JavaScript files inside of a scripts directory. However, um, from the public directory, whatever the static directory, root directory is, a file is going to be hosted inside the socket IO directory that is the client side scripts. So this is what's making all the magic happen. This is what we're using to import to build out this socket object that automatically is then going to be connected to the server that serves this client script. Oh, no, cancel. Okay. So let's go back over here. So I will now close that out.
Okay, so now the next thing I want to do, now that we've successfully have the client connecting to the WebSocket server on the server and invoking a connection event is I want to show you another automatic or built-in event that WebSockets have, and it's a disconnect event. So I actually want to handle what happens when a disconnect event occurs. I want to bind a callback function to that. So here we're going to use socket IOs to handle a disconnect event for, for a socket. And so each socket object fires a special disconnect event when the connection is either closed or disrupted. So let's go ahead and uh, refactor our on connection function inside of our app.js file that will bind a callback function to the socket server to listen for and trigger when a disconnect event occurs. So let's update our on connection. So here, inside of app.js, inside of on connection here, I'm going to add, so socket, as you might recall, is the object that gets passed in. It's the socket object that gets passed in when a client connects. So now in this instance, we're actually gonna make use of that socket object. So we can do things, we can set up events on that socket. So if a disconnect happens on that particular socket, then we can trigger the callback function on, in, on disconnect, which we haven't built yet. So let's go ahead and implement that. And all we're gonna do for our app for a disconnect event is to log it on the server to see that it actually occurred. But you might need to handle uh, the logic for disconnecting a user uh, with logic that like, um, I don't know, uh, um, um, logs them out of the system on the server side. So here you would manage whatever logic requires you to disconnect a user from your system. Here, we're not building a complex system, so it's, it's, it's relatively trivial, but it gives you an idea of why this might be important. Okay, so for on disconnect, all we're gonna do is put console.log user disconnect. Excellent. And again, all of the logic that we'll, we'll be doing on this, the socket moving forward is gonna be inside of this on connection callback function because this is where we get a reference to all the uh, client sockets. And then we can listen to various events on those client sockets and cause callback functions to trigger in regard to them. Okay, so once I have this callback function uh, defined, let's go ahead and test it out and see if we can't listen for disconnect events. So let's uh, kill the server, let's clear our console, let's go ahead and relaunch it here for listening. And actually, why don't I do this? I will let's create two here. So, uh, yeah, okay, so here, a user's connected. Let me refresh this, a user's connected, disconnected. So notice when I refresh the page, it disrupts the signal and it's gonna disconnect and then connect, disconnect and then connect when I refresh. And then if I open up another tab, it's gonna show a new user connected. If I close it, it's gonna show a user disconnected. So here we can see either refreshing the page or closing a tab, closing a page is going to cause that disconnect, uh, that disconnect event to trigger. And then our callback to console log down the server is then uh, getting invoked. Excellent. So, so far, what we've done with our WebSocket server is we've made use of the connection event and the disconnect uh, uh, event. Right, those are the two built-in events that we have access to. But one of the powerful things about uh, WebSockets and Socket IO in particular is the ability to create user-defined events and listen for those. So why don't we see how can we start emitting our own event to the server? So here, our goal is when a user types in a message, we want the server to get it as a chat message event. And again, the approach that we'll use is we'll use socket IO to emit that event to the server. And so the main idea is behind socket IO is that you can send and receive any events you want with any data you want. Typically, we encode that data as JSON, but it also supports binary data as well. 
So the first thing we want to do is inside of our client side chat application, we want to handle that submit event. We're not doing that yet. So let's go ahead and uh, define a callback function for the submit event. So let me grab this. So what we'll do is we're going to update the chat.js file to handle the submit event from the form and emit its value to the server. And on the sockets emit, the first parameter is the name of the event and the second parameter is the data that will be transmitted. So let's go to our implementation here. Perfect. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab from the document by those IDs, the form, the input, and the chat. Those are the three things we're going to need in order to build up what we want to send to the server. So remember, the chat is the uh, unordered list. We might not be using that yet, but we'll use it in the future. The uh, form ID is going to be the form element in the HTML, and then the um, input is going to be this input uh, HTML element. So we're going to grab those so we have reference to them in our JavaScript. Then on the form, we're going to set up an event listener to go ahead and listen for a submit event. And then on a submit event, we're going to trigger the submit event callback function. And again, just like socket IO callback functions default to having socket objects recall that for event listening on the uh from our viewport it sends in event objects we're not going to use it but i just want to highlight the similarity here now since i'm using the submit event here i want to prevent the normal uh default behavior of the event so actually i guess i will be using the event so what is this event uh prevent default well let's take a look at the the documentation. So here, what we want to do is the prevent default method of the event tells the user agent that if the event does not get explicitly handled, its default action should not be taken as it normally would. So recall on a submit event, it normally sends to a particular endpoint a particular HTTP action, and we don't want to do that. Now, I could have just as easily defined this as a click event and not had to do this at all. But I just want to illustrate that we can uh, uh, um, prevent default behaviors from events like the submit event from occurring. And that's all we're doing here. So the core logic, though, is we're going to check if the input HTML element actually has a value inside of it. So if the user had actually typed something in this text field, then we want to take the socket object right, that we have imported and that's connected to our server, and we want to emit to it a new event that we're creating ourselves right now. Uh, again, init takes two parameters. The first is the event name we want to give to this event. We'll call this a chat message. And the second is going to be the data payload, which could be a JSON object. In this instance, I'm just going to pass in the value, which is going to be a string value. But you could also pass in uh, a JSON here if you had more complex data than just a string message. And so here, I'm just going to go into the uh, HTML element and grab the value and set that as the payload. And I'm going to emit this to the socket object. Then after this has been emitted to the socket object, I want to um, reset the value of this input field to be blank. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to set it so that it's empty. OK, so now I have set up some logic that will emit an event to my server. The next thing I want to do is then I need to go ahead and refactor my on connection callback function on the server side to to uh, bind a callback function and listen for the event that might get emitted from the client side. So remember, the client side is going to emit, event, uh, emit an event that's called chat message. So now I need to have a callback function that does something when a chat message event triggers on the server side. So again, I'm going to put all of the event listening for my WebSocket application inside this on connection callback function. So for the socket that gets passed in, I'm going to listen for a chat message event to occur. And if that does occur, I'm going to go ahead and trigger this on chat message callback function. So let's define the logic for this callback function. So here, 
when the callback function occurs, remember the first parameter when we emit an event is the uh, event name. The second is the data payload, which is automatically passed in as a parameter to the callback function when that event is triggered. So here I'll just call my parameter MSG for message, but what, but what it actually is going to be is the data that is contained as the second parameter. So it's gonna be the string here. So I'm gonna just take that and I'm gonna console log that with message and I'll concatenate that with whatever message got emitted to the server. Okay, and once I do, do that, let me go ahead and do npm start and uh, see if we can't send these events along with the data payloads to the web uh, socket server. So let's do npm start. Excellent. So now what I'm going to do, users connect it, users connect it. Nice. Okay, so I want to send a hello world. So I'm going to input a value into the input field. I'm going to hit the send button that's going to trigger that submit event, which is going to emit this to the server. And oh, did I should let's see here? Let's make sure everything is saved. This is saved. This is saved. This is saved. And this is saved. OK, let's try that again. Let me make sure on chat message, on chat message, message. Yeah, so it looks good to me. Let's kill this. Let's clear and let's do npm start again. Okay, so let's refresh. Hello world. Okay, there we go. So it might have been just a caching issue or something not saved, but here we can now see when I put a message into the input field. When I hit the send button, I now created a message that got, evid, um, that got emitted from my client to the server. That was chat message. When the server got it, it triggered the callback function, which then console log that here. And then remember part of that submit event was then to clear out the input field. So this is, Ted. So I'll send that. And there it is message. This is Ted. And then this empty that. Perfect. So now, now we're able to broadcast our messages from the client to the server. But now the next thing we're going to want to do, if we want this to be a real time chat app, is to actually go ahead and get uh, the client to get this, this the, the new state, all these messages from the server and to actually broadcast them to all connected uh, clients. No, cancel that. Control Sing. Okay, there. And actually, let me uh, kill this right now. And we will clear this. Okay, perfect. So then, the last thing I'm really going to want to do with this ba very basic uh, uh, lab is to be able to broadcast that events from the server to all connected clients. So. And in order to do this, uh, we can send an event to all users using socket IO uh, with the emit from the IO server. So right now we saw how we can use a socket object to emit an event from the client to the, the, um, the server, but the server, remember our WebSocket server has an emit method that uses the same parameters. I can pass an event name and then I can pass it in as a second parameter, a data payload, and that data payload can be a JSON, it could be a, a JavaScript object, or it could be uh, you know, just uh, my message, it could be my string. But it's, it's designed very similar as the client side emit, but this will broadcast to all connected clients. So let's refactor our on-chat message here to actually do that emit based off of this syntax so that um, whenever an on-chat message gets sent to the server, the server will then rebroadcast or re-emit it to all clients with the chat message event name and with that data payload. 
So here we're going to go in here and instead of just console logging it, we're going to also set tell IO, which is our WebSocket server, to emit the event chat message with the data that got passed in from the client. And now that we're emitting something to the client through the socket object that's exposed on the client side, we have to create a function to handle a chat message event from the socket object. So let's do that. So the same way we create event listening on the socket objects on the server side, we can do that on the client side. Again, it's a full duplex two-way uh, mechanism and the, the syntax is the same on both sides. So let's go to our chat. And so what I'm going to do is that socket object here that I got set up, I'm going to set up an event listener. So on a chat message event, which is now in getting admitted to clients from the server, I want to invoke this append message callback function. So we can create a callback function that triggers in response to it. So the callback function we're going to do here is we're going to grab the message. So recall here that the payload is the second parameter is automatically delivered to the callback function that's sent either to the client or the server. So in this instance, it's going to be a string of message, but it could be more than just a string, right? It could be a JavaScript object if it was more complex, a data type. And here I'm going to create a list item element, right? With that message, and I'm gonna append that to the inner HTML of my chat. Now, if you remember what chat is, it's this uh, unordered list here. So I'm just gonna append this, uh, the, the, the um, message as a, line, a list item. And then on the window object, I'm going to tell it to scroll to the bottom, right? So it, I need to give it an X and Y coordinate. So every time I add a message, I want to make sure that we're at the bottom of the page where we always have access to this input uh, field. So after I append the message, if this is a sufficiently long conversation, I stay at the bottom of the page. And again, if I want to see what that does, I could go to the MDN web docs and say, oh, there's a scroll to function. It scrolls to a particular set of coordinates in the document. And so the X coordinate is just zero and the Y coordinate is gonna be uh, based off the scroll height of the body uh, object from the DOM. So we'll use the DOM to determine what the bottom is. Excellent. So let's go back over here. Once I do that callback function and I'm listening on that event, that should be it. I should be able to go do NPM start and actually have real-time communication between clients. So actually, let's go over here. Here, let's actually pull this out and shrink it some so we can actually see this in practice. Okay, let's do NPM start. Okay, we should be connected. Let me refresh. Let me refresh both pages to make sure that uh, all the new code updates are now being imported in. And now let me go, hello world. I'm gonna send that and notice instantly it not only updates on my page, but on this additional client page. Bye. Hello there. And then I get the update here. Yeah, who are you? Excellent. And we could see how we can now have this two-way communication, real-time communication, real-time updates between our clients, all of our clients and our server. And so if for any reason your application requires this, this is a great template to use. Now, I, I do have a question for you all. So first of all, is there any questions related to this? So some quick conclusions about what we've been able to do in this kind of lightweight applic uh, uh, a lab. So here in this lab, we implement a real-time chat application using WebSockets and Socket.io. The lab covered installing, importing, and initializing Socket.io on both the server and the client. And we use Socket.io to emit and handle events from the client. Uh, we use Socket.io to listen for and broadcast events to all our clients. Improvements that I would make to this particular application would be to style the chat app to be more attractive, 
to add usernames and login requirements for the chat app, to store message histories to send to all connected users, maybe make different chat rooms for users to join or to give a list of connected users to display inside of the chat app. So this is, this is future features I build on top of this MVP. So is there any questions about WebSockets and how we can use WebSockets for real-time data transmissions between front end and back end? Or does this seem pretty much clear enough? And of course, if you wanna do more than this, you can just hit the documentation because you've, you've learned the entire baseline events, like how to set it up on the client, how to set it up on the server, and how to, how to set up the event listeners that get triggered based off of events that get broadcast to either side. So if there's no questions about this. Yeah, it's much easier to kind of set up um, two-way communication using JavaScript than say, for instance, Java. I know that the networking class typically has you build a chat room uh, with a server client uh, using Java. And this is far, far simpler, as you can tell. Now, my plan was to do a... Um, a kind of more advanced application that showed how we could handle different events. I'm just interested to see if you would be interested in maybe a follow-up lab that would do that. I can give you a sample of what that would look like. So my uh, one of my original intents was to create um, a basic little kind of socket IO. Uh, kind of a socket IO game. So it would look like this. Let me do npm start. Okay, so let me go here. So it'd be like a, a basic monster capture game. And the concepts are the same, right? Where I can create a character on this end, right? And as I move my character around, I could see it here. But now I'm not, I'm not in this other app. Notice if I was, I could see how many monsters I caught. So here, let me create another user. And then here, this user can then catch and have a scoreboard and compete. And then let me focus in on here. So I don't know if they'd be interested in seeing. Now, Conceptually, all that's happening here is the same thing that we just did with the, uh, the user chat app. It just illustrates that we can make real-time uh, multiplayer browser-based games using this technology. And it's just a slight expansion off of this concept of being able to figure out how to serialize the data to transmit it to all clients so it's constantly updating. So would there be interest potentially of having some optional uh, follow-up lab where you could see how that simple web game is created. And if so, just let me know. And uh, I might make that, uh, I might pin it up and make it available. But conceptually, it's doing the same thing that we just did in this lab. Excellent. Okay, with that said, I that's all this lab has. So we'll, we'll probably call it a little bit early, at least um, in terms of the lecture recording today. Let me go ahead and stop the recording.